Hello, welcome to this training module, Components and Installation, one of a series of subsurface drainage design presentations. Our goal with this series is to provide you with the knowledge you need to design subsurface drainage systems and underground outlets. I'm Bruce Atherton, Agricultural Engineer with NRCS in Ankeny, Iowa. Let's get started reviewing components and installation of subsurface drains. In this presentation, we will review the components and installation requirements for subsurface drainage and underground outlets. We will re review the functions of underground drains, list the components of a drainage system, list the components of an underground outlet system, review surface inlet design criteria, review alternative inlets, and review construction specifications for pipe and tile. As we have learned previously, the functions performed by subsurface drainage systems and underground outlet systems are stated in the practice standards and include the following. Removing excess soil water. This is the function of a subsurface drain and criteria are found in the 606 standard. Removing excess surface water under the ground surface. This is the function of an underground outlet. Criteria are found in the 620 standard. Conveying the collected water to a suitable outlet. Both systems incorporate this function. For conditions in Iowa, gravity is the primary force moving the water through the system. However, some systems may have a pump outlet at the end if there is no free gravity outlet. As noted, the NRCS practice standards provide the criteria NRCS uses to design subsurface drains and underground outlets. Along with the engineering plans, NRCS construction specifications describe how a system is to be installed. Construction specifications provide details important to the installation of subsurface drain or underground outlet. There are three NRCS construction spef specifications related to subsurface drains and underground outlets. IA45 plastic pipe, IA46 tile drains for land drainage, and IA620 underground outlets. These can be found on the Iowa NRCS engineering webpage or in section 4 of the field office technical guide. One or more of these construction specifications will need to be attached to any engineering plan that includes a subsurface drain or underground outlet. A subsurface drainage system can have several components depending on the site conditions. We will list these components here and describe them further in the following slides. The main component is the conduit by pipe or tile. Depending on the location of the system, the conduit will be called either a lateral, a main, or a submain. An outlet pipe will be required where the main outlets the collected water. Most outlet pipes will require an animal guard. NRCS specifies that conduits be joined using manufactured connections and the end of the conduit be closed with manufactured end caps. A relief well may be needed to relieve excessive pressure on a main or submain, or a breather may be needed to relieve negative pressure on a main or submain. If sedimentation may be an issue, a sediment trap can be installed in the main or submain. Bedding and or filters may be needed under certain site conditions. In a subsurface drainage system, the conduit has different names depending on where in the system it is located. In the schematic of a drainage system, the laterals are those conduits with no other drain lines connected to them, shown here and here. The laterals collect the excess soil water and carry it to a main or submain. The main receives water from the laterals or submains and deliver, delivers it to the outlet. Submains collect water from laterals and deliver it to the main. In general, mains and submains are assumed to provide no lateral drainage. A rule of thumb is to assume mains or submains over 8 inches will provide no lateral drainage, and a lateral should be installed near them to provide this function. 
The reason for this is that mains or submains may flow full for a considerable period of time after a precipitation event, and so cannot provide an avenue for excess soil water near them to enter the drain during that time. Although the designer could specify that the conduit meets the IA46 construction specification, the designer really needs to specify the conduit by reference to an ASTM or other standard. If we only reference IA46, the installer can select any of the pipes shown in that specification, which might not be the conduit material used in the design. For example, we may use 15-inch dual wall pipe for a portion of the design because it's because of its capacity, rather than 15-inch single wall pipe. But if we don't specify the dual wall pipe, the installer is quite likely to use 15-inch single wall pipe, which would not have the design capacity assumed in the system design. So your plans must specify the ASTM standard the pipe is required to meet. This slide shows the ASTM standards for common agricultural drainage pipe. The ASTM standard a pipe needs will be stamped on the pipe or provided with documentation accompanying the delivered pipe. When the main outlets to an open channel or a stream, an outlet pipe is needed to transition from the conduit to the free outlet. It is not appropriate to use single wall corrugated plastic drain pipe for the outlet pipe. The IA46 construction specification lists several conduit materials suitable for use as an outlet pipe. Each material has advantages and disadvantages. For example, if burning of ditch banks is anticipated, a plastic outlet pipe would be a poor choice. The designer should specify the outlet pipe material to be installed. Some options for outlet pipe material include corrugated metal pipe, either galvanized or aluminum, smooth steel pipe with a minimum 3 16 inch thick wall, smooth plastic pipe, or corrugated profile wall PE pipe. All outlet pipes must be equipped with an animal guard. This slide shows two acceptable flat type animal guards. The animal guard should be in place when the outlet pipe is installed. There have been instances where a raccoon has entered the outlet pipe while the contractor went back to the shop to get a missing animal guard. Many contractors will install the animal guard in the shop prior to taking the outlet pipe to the field to ensure that the guard is in place when needed. When this is done, the installer must be careful to install the outlet pipe in the proper orientation. For connections, NRCS specifies that we use manufactured connections, Ys, Ts, and end caps. It also specifies that the connections with the outlet pipe shall be watertight. A relief well is meant to relieve pressure in the line. They're usually installed where steep sections change to flat sections unless the flatter section has about 25% greater capacity than the steeper section. Relief wells are often used on lines with surface inlets. The reef, leaf well outlet must be stable. Note that the water from a relief well should be released at or near the ground surface. This will minimize pressure on the system. Relief wells are most often used where a new system is connected to an existing main or submain that does not have the capacity required by the new system. Relief wells should not be used to underdesign a new main in a system to save money. Breathers look very similar to relief wells, but provide a different function. Breathers relieve negative pressure in the line. These are installed where flat sections change abruptly to steep sections. If sediment is a hazard, a sediment trap can be installed to provide a place to collect and remove sediment. We don't see these very often in the field, but these are used where sediment is a hazard. Envelopes are used where drains are installed in poor site conditions or to improve flow into the drain. A drain envelope is a generic term that includes any type of material placed on or around a subsurface drain for one or more of the following purposes. 
to stabilize the soil structure of the surrounding soil material. This is known as a filter envelope. To improve flow conditions in the immediate vicinity of the drain, a hydraulic envelope. Or to provide a structure bedding for the drain, and this is known as bedding. This schematic illustrates the three types of envelopes. The left drawing illustrates sand and gravel bedding used to provide support for the pipe. We will discuss proper installation of pipes in later slides. The center drawing illustrates a filter envelope used in unstable soil conditions. A site-specific filter design will be needed. The drawing on the right illustrates a hydraulic envelope which will improve flow to the pipe from the surrounding soil. Now that we have listed the components of a subsurface drainage system, let's consider the components of an underground outlet. The surface inlet is the component of an underground outlet system that is different from a surface subsurface drainage system. Since we have discussed the components that are common with the subsurface drain, we will limit the following discussion to the underground outlet, inlet, and components of that inlet. The underground outlet inlet consists of the inlet, an orifice plate if needed, an offset pipe if needed, and of course the conduit that provides the outlet for the underground outlet. Since we've already discussed the conduit, this discussion will be about the inlet, orifice, and offset pipe. Each of these components has a specific purpose. An inlet can be a collection box, blind inlet, perforated riser, perforated conduit, or other appropriate device. The perforated riser is probably the most common type of inlet used in Iowa for underground outlets, draining terraces, water and sediment control basins, and natural basins. The capacity of the underground outlet for natural or constructed basins shall be adequate for the intended purpose without causing inundation damage to crops, vegetation, or works of improvement. The inlet has two main functions. One, to allow the surface water to enter the underground outlet at a rate equal to or greater than the design discharge rate. And two, to prevent trash or debris from entering the underground outlet that will plug the orifice, offset pipe, or conduit. Orifice plates are used to restrict flow into the conduit in order to prevent pressure flow. A flow restricting device is required for gravity flow systems if the conduit is not large enough to avoid pressure flow. Orifice plates, when used, shall be made of metal or durable plastic fit tight against the seat of connectors and have a smooth edge. Use the engineering field tool software or other appropriate design tools to determine the capacity of orifices or other types of devices which restrict flow. An offset pipe isolates the surface inlet from the main conduit. An offset pipe is required between the inlet and the underground outlet conduit unless the outlet conduit does not extend upstream from the inlet. The minimum length of the offset pipe shall be 8 feet. There is risk that the inlet could be damaged. By offsetting the inlet from the conduit, the risk of damage to the conduit is lessened. The offset pipe could be used to limit flow to the conduit, thus avoiding the use of an orifice plate. The engineering field tool software can incorporate this into the design. This is a portion of the surface inlet design screen from the engineering field tool software. And this is version 3.3.0.5. This is the EFT design report for surface inlet. You can see the inputs are documented on the left while the output is printed on the right. In EFT version 3.3.0.5, the flow from the offset is not displayed on the crate correctly, so I copy the value onto the printout.
Here are examples of other types of perforated inlets. Unfortunately, the EFP UGO design software cannot be used to design a system directly with these types of inlets. To evaluate one of these alternatives, we could compare the open area per foot of riser and ensure that the alternative inlet had as much or more open area as the regular perforated riser used in our design. An alternative inlet you may have heard of is popular in Minnesota. The Minnesota Rock Inlet is a type of blind inlet. It is being promoted as a phosphorus reducing practice. This slide shows a, a schematic, a general schematic of the Minnesota Rock Inlet. And you should note that this design does not meet an RCS 620 standard. Some of the results uh, they've had from the Minnesota Rock Inlet are as follows. Um, I've only found information from one year and two storm events, and they saw a 17% reduction in sediment. However, a modeling study from Minnesota showed that no-till with a flush inlet would reduce sediment loading by 22 to 24 percent. And reducing a flush, replacing a flush inlet with a one-foot slotted riser would reduce sediment loading by about 50 percent. So it appears that the perforated riser provides the same benefits as a Minnesota rock inlet compared with a flush inlet. One of the concerns with uh, rock inlets or blind inlets is that sedimentation will cause them to plug. ARS scientists in Indiana have conducted research on a blind inlet that is more likely to meet the NRCS 620 standard. This and the following photos are from an installation in Harding County, Iowa in April of 2014. This site will be monitored, so we should be getting some good data on the performance of these blind inlets in a few years. This uh, design of this blind inlet was based exactly on the blind inlets used by ARS scientists in Indiana during their research. And it consisted of a 14 foot long by 14 foot wide by 3.3 foot deep excavation. Of course, the depth of the excavation uh, may have to be adjusted by the depth of the tile outlet. After the excavation, uh, they put a layer, four inch layer of coarse limestone on the bottom and then installed a 10 by 10 foot square perforated pipe to collect water from the inlet and direct it to the uh, outlet conduit. After the pipe in is installed, uh, another two feet of coarse limestone was placed over the pipe. After the rock was installed, a geotextile was placed over the rock to separate the rock uh, from the sand over. So this photo shows the finished, finished product where they put 12 inches of sand over the geotextile. In some cases, I believe they've tried to put uh, regular field soil over the geotextile, but I'm not certain how well that works. In this photo, you see that the uh, perforated riser is still in place, and they have left this in place to provide a uh, way to uh, grab samples from the tile outflow of this system. They, they will block off the bottom holes in the perforated riser so that the floodwaters cannot exit through the riser, but will have to go through the line inlet. From their research uh, on a field scale study of these blind inlets, uh, the Indiana, Indiana researchers found that most individual storm events over a two year period resulted in rather dramatic reductions in sediment, phosphorus, and nitrogen loading from the fields. In 2010, the result was a 461 kilogram per hectare decrease in sediment loading and a 210 gram per hectare decrease in total phosphorus loading. 
which translates to decreases of 79 and 78 percent, respectively. One concern, though, is that these blind inlets may plug with soils with sediment, so I think we need to have these monitored over a longer period of time to be uh, quite certain of their performance. For the remainder of the presentation, we're going to look at proper installation of subsurface drains and underground outlet components. This slide shows a detailed drawing of an outlet pipe. I want you to note the following in particular. At least two-thirds of the pipe is underground. Rock protection is used to protect the bank if the outlet pipe does not extend into the channel. And at least two foot of cover is needed over the conduit unless we take precautions to protect the conduit from crushing from high machinery loads. The subsurface drain pipe depends on proper installation for its strength. All pipe needs to be properly bedded in order to perform as designed. This schematic shows proper pipe installation with a semicircular, trapezoidal, or V-groove bedding shape. You can see here that the V-groove shape is limited to the small diameter tubing or pipe, size 6 inches or less. We can see that the trench has to be the outside diameter plus six inches at a minimum for trench installation and the outside diameter plus four inches minimum for plow installation. And one, if the trench gets too wide, which is the outside diameter plus 12 inches at the top of the pipe, we need to hand compact the blinding or use a granular envelope, which we mentioned earlier. This schematic shows the proper groove is about 35% of the pipe radius, uh, irrespective of which type of groove you're using. It is important that these bedding criteria are met. The pipe manufacturer's warranty will be void if the pipe is not installed with a bedding groove. Here's a photograph of a semi-circular groove uh, during a pipe installation and this looks like a really nice installation job and you can see that the conduit is well supported around the bottom part of the diameter. Most drain trenchers and plows will have a groover on the machine but it always pays to check. Some of the pull behind uh, drain plows uh, do not have a groover and thus would not install pipe to meet our specifications. Here in the bottom left you can see a, a very good uh, drain installation. Here are two other grooving methods. For larger pipe in the upper right, an excavator with a special bucket can be used to form the bottom of the trench and give the pipe good support. A regular backhoe cannot install the appropriate groove. Here you can see the uh, rough bottom of a trench excavator with a regular backhoe and some finished work would have to be done here uh, to provide proper bedding for the pipe. It is a very, very important to pay attention around connections. Here you can see an example where the connections were not made correctly. It looks like they got the uh, trench too deep and you see a dip in the lateral pipes before they make the connection. Uh, that will not provide a very good flow characteristic into the main. And finally, we see an example where a 12 inch pipe was installed with a 24 inch groove. And you can certainly see the deflection on the 12 inch pipe where it was not supported properly. Well that brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope you found the, this module helpful. Please call or email me if you have questions or comments about this subject. I'm always looking for ways to improve these presentations. Good luck.